Tinakota Katori, everyone. Um, yeah, James Thompson, Group Controller, Group Manager. Um, I suppose I'm just going to just, just do a wee bit of history of the, the Alpine Fault or AF8 project and then hand over to Tom to talk about the science, which is the exciting bit. Um, but this, this really kicked off for Canterbury uh, back in about 2012, 2013, when I actually contracted Tom when he was a student um, to create a realistic scenario for us to exercise an Alpine Fault earthquake. Um, and we, we conducted that exercise, I think it was 2014? 2013. 2013. Um, and about two years after that, the, the six South Island Civil Defence Emergency Management Group managers decided that the South Island should be better prepared for Alpine Fault. And at that point in time, they kicked off the AUF8 project. So the AUF8 project, once again, um, delved into the science to establish what it would look like across the South Island should it occur. Um, including not just the, the hazard itself, the, the earthquake, but what are all the consequences of it. And so that piece of work was done and then uh, uh, we, we used that to drive what we call the Safer South Island Alpine Fault Earthquake Response Plan. And that sort of details the initial actions that we would take over the first seven days at a very strategic level for the South Island. Um, it's the only project like this um, Currently in New Zealand, there are others that are trying to sort of catch up in the Hikarangi space and um, Mount Taranaki space. Um, so it's been a real pr privilege to be a part of this program uh, and, and see a, that, that collaborative effort across the whole of the South Island and, um, and more recently nationally. But I'll hand over to Tom to talk about it and then happy to take questions at the end. Tom. Thanks, James. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is Dr. Tom Robinson. So I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Canterbury. Um, I'm part of the School of Earth and Environment, specialising in disaster risk and resilience. And so uh, my background is very much in alpine fault earthquake um, science, thinking about um, the the impacts really from start to finish of what an, earth, uh, an earthquake on the alpine fault would, would look like. So my PhD. Um, was a lot of the, as James said, a kickoff for, for AF8, um, which stands for Alpine Fault Magnitude 8. I'm, I've subsequently worked quite a lot on the Kaikoura earthquake, currently working a lot on the response to Cyclone Gabriel in the North Island, um, and interspersed, did some work over in, in Nepal following the Nepal earthquake. So lots and lots of experience um, working with earthquakes. I, I'm typically used to lecturing in front, of a, in front of a student audience and walking around, so you have to forgive me if I wave my arms around um, pointing at stuff. But... I've just got a few slides that I really want to kind of run you through and give you some background to the science of where we're coming from um, to kind of show um, and hopefully convince you that this isn't all just made up off the top of our heads. There's this, some real uh, groundbreaking world-leading science behind this. And then take you through what an Alpine Fault earthquake might actually look like and what the consequences of that could be um, for the South Island and for New Zealand Inc. Um, as, uh, in, a, in a more uh, wider sense. I hope to get through this reasonably quickly because I imagine or I hope there'll be some, I hope you've got a lot of questions that you want to answer me, uh, ask, ask, ask us that we can answer. So I'll try to get through this reasonably quickly and give you time, uh, plenty of time to, to, to talk to us. So um, just to start off um, with a setting, um, I'm sure many of you are somewhat, somewhat familiar with this, but um, just, just to, to start out, New Zealand um, sits uh, here. Uh, does that work? Yes, here at the bottom of the, bottom of the Pacific. Um, and this red uh, ring that goes all the way around the edge of the Pacific, you may have heard referred to as, uh, as the Pacific Ring of Fire, uh, which is a colloquial term um, that's used. Um, and it explains the, the plate boundary that runs from the very tip of Chile all the way up through, um, through the Central Americas, through California, the famous San Andreas Fault, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, up through into Alaska, down through Japan, um, the main subduction zone that runs up Japan, through Papua New Guinea, and then here through little old New Zealand um, in the bottom of the South, South Pacific. Um, and so New Zealand is exceptionally complex um, tectonically um, for a variety of reasons. Um, main reason being is that that plate boundary or that Pacific Ring of Fire um, is offshore of, sorry, me, offshore of New Zealand uh, in the North Island. It then comes onshore um, into the South Island as the Alpine Fault and then disappears offshore um, as the Pusica Trench that heads off down, down to Antarctica. So we're 
lucky in some respects in that um, geologically we are one of only two places um, in the world where you can go and see the Pacific um, plate boundary on land, the other place being the San Andreas Fault. Um, and here in New Zealand, uh, it comes ashore as, as the Alpine Fault, which you can see here, running from Marlborough down through to uh, about Milford Sound. And this is really important because when we look at the distribution of earthquakes across New Zealand, so this is um, all uh, earthquakes, it's quite an old plot now, but um, hasn't changed much. Um, this shows you the location of all earthquakes, um, shallow earthquakes less than 40 kilometers below the surface. Um, over a 10 year period between 1990 and 1999. It would be the same if we took um, 2010 to 2020, for instance. And you can see that distribution of, of earthquakes follows the plate boundary um, very nicely. So we have off lots of uh, deep offshore earthquakes, and then transitions on line, uh, land, and you can see, um, define the Alpine Fault um, pretty well. And then we have the Pusica Trench there. So this is, this is important in the New Zealand context because this means we're talking about a large plate boundary fault. And plate boundary faults are uh, the biggest, the most active um, faults in the world. So they can sustain the largest earthquakes and they can sustain those earthquakes relatively frequently on a geologic um, time frame. So several hundred years, um, as, as we'll see. And again, to put this in perspective, something like 60 to 70% of the world's major earthquakes occur in that red zone, and something like 80% of the world's uh, most dangerous volcanoes occur in that red zone. Um, and again, as you can see, that's, that's where we uh, end up existing. So let's, let's just dive straight into to the Alpine Fault and, and, and what that is and why we care so much about the Alpine Fault. So the Alpine Fault's regularly referred to as the world's straightest line. If you ever look at a satellite image or Google Earth image um, and you look at the west coast, you'll see a nice clear straight line running from Milford Sound all the way up to the Lewis Pass. And that, that is the Alpine Fault that you can see uh, defined here um, as this uh, red line. And one of the things we're very, very keen to understand about the Alpine Fault is when has it suffered earthquakes in the past so that we can understand when it might suffer um, earthquakes um, in the future. And so until um, about 2015, 2016, we didn't know an awful lot about Earth, Alpine Fault earthquakes. We knew maybe three or four of the most recent events. But in, um, in the mid-20-teens, uh, mid um, we found a site um, that looks something like this. You don't necessarily need to know the details of, of the geology of this. But this is a really important site um, globally for understanding earthquakes. And the reason for that is it actually records previous earthquakes on the Alpine Fault. We very rarely actually see earthquakes recorded in rock. And so what you can see here is you can see these recurring patterns. So we have a gray um, rock uh, overlain by a brown rock, and then another gray rock, and then a brown rock, and a gray rock, etc. So we get these zebra stripes. And we know categorically that each one of these transitions from uh, brown to gray must be an Alpine Fault earthquake, because at this <coughs> site, um, the Alpine Fault ruptures, it blocks a river, and so you instantly change the type of rock that you're depositing. And so by looking at the, the boundary between those two and finding um, leaves or uh, anything that we can really carbon date, we can get very, very accurate dates of when that fault ruptured. Now the reason that I'm highlighting this, and this is important, is if we move to the graph here on the uh, right-hand side, what we have running along the um, horizontal axis here, we go back to about the year 6000 BC, and then we move forward um, until about now, give or take 2000 AD, and then we uh, forward into the future. So we're, we're presenting time. Each one of these little squiggly graphs on here is showing you a dated Alpine Fault earthquake. And so the size of that, that little squiggle is telling you how confident um, we are in when it occurred. So basically the width. So for instance, if you see this one here that I'm pointing at, it's a reasonably wide squiggle. So we know it happened around about 2000 BC, give or take. Some of these, particularly more recent ones, you can see we're very, very confident on exactly when they happened. So the key thing to take away from this is the number of squiggles that we've got on this graph. So we've got 28. Um, earthquakes in total going back about 8,000 years. That's the best earthquake record in the world. We know more about 
um, when the Alpine Fault has ruptured in the last 8,000 years than we do places like the San Andreas or even um, parts of Japan. And so we know that for the last 8,000 years, the Alpine Fault has had 28 earthquakes. Um, going back beyond that, it's almost certainly had many more earthquakes and there is no reason to suspect that it's going to suddenly stop just because we're here and, and studying it. So that's the, that's the key takeaway from this. The other key takeaway is um, arguably more scary um, and why we're here today is if you look at the pattern, you can draw an almost perfectly straight line through all of those earthquakes. And if you could keep projecting that up to where the next earthquake would be, it's around about there around about the year 2000-ish AD. And so what we really want to know is, what's the time between these events? Uh, over the last 8,000 years, how long has it been between each Alpine Fault earthquake? And if you take the average number of years between each of those, it works out to be about 298, let's say 300 to, to round it up with some, with some error of around about 60 years, give or take, so human lifespan. Um, so we think this Alpine Fault suffers a major earthquake every 300 years. And importantly, it's exceptionally consistent, almost metronomic in how often it sustains big earthquakes. The shortest period between Alpine Fault earthquakes is 140 years, and the longest is about 500 years. But the average is 300. We know very accurately that the last earthquake was in 1717 AD. So some quick maths takes us to 2017, which was five years ago, uh, or six years ago coming up for. So that's, that's where we find ourselves. We are right at the time when we would expect an Alpine Fault earthquake to occur based on the average going back the last 8,000 years. That leads us to believe, um, using some fairly complicated statistics, that there is a 75% chance the Alpine Fault will rupture in the next 50 years. So to, to put that in perspective um, for you, there's a very good chance that this earthquake will happen in either our lifetimes and almost certainly in our children's lifetimes. So I have a three-year-old daughter. I fully expect her to be alive for an Alpine Fault earthquake over the, her, her lifetime. That's, that's where we're at with that. So again, I'll just go back through those key messages there that we have evidence of you know, 27, 28 earthquakes over the last 8,000 years. It has a long history of rupturing. That is not going to stop just because we're here. We're, the next earthquake is inevitable. And the average time between earthquakes is about 300 years, with the last one occurring slightly more than 300 years ago. So that puts us right at the precipice of when we would expect an Alpine Fault to, to occur. So let's, let's look at what an Alpine Fault earthquake might actually be and what it, what it might look like, because now we know that one is inevitable and is likely to happen within many of our lifetimes, we kind of want to know how big and how bad that's going to be. So again, looking back at those 27, 28 earthquakes um, over the past, we can tell that the vast majority of them were in the region of about magnitude 8. Now, that probably doesn't mean a lot to, to anybody outside of my small um, office um, in the university. So let me, let me put that in perspective, what we mean by magnitude 8. Magnitude 8 would be um, vertical displacements, so the ground instantaneously moving something like 2 to 3 metres. So, for instance, um, if the fault were to run through the middle of this room um, and we were the side of being lifted up, we would go through the ceiling. Um, and a displacement of 8 to 10 metres horizontally. So um, James and I would probably disappear out that window um, somewhere in several seconds. Um, and to continue putting that pers perspective, we can think about this in terms of the amount of energy that this would release compared to previous earthquakes in New Zealand, of which we've got several to choose from. So this little green dot here represents the energy or the power that was released in the magnitude 6.2 earthquake on February um, 22nd, 2011, that did all the damage um, in Christchurch. This would represent the September 4th magnitude 7.1 earthquake that occurred in Darfield. This is the 2016 November earthquake and 7.8 in Kaikoura. And this is the uh, a magnitude 8 earthquake on the Alpine Fault. So you can see um, while it's only you know, 1.8 
magnitude steps bigger than the, what happened in Christchurch in 2011. This is a logarithmic scale. The energy goes up very quickly. Um, we're talking about an earthquake that could be a thousand times stronger than what happened in Christchurch um, in 2011. That's the magnitude of this, this, this event. The other way we can think about this is in something called intensity, so how powerful the shaking would be. And I'm going to show you some maps of the, the, the intensity of shaking that we would expect across the South Island. Um, where we start to get concerned is when we start to get into what's called MM intensities of 7 and above. That's where we start to see damage. Um, so in the next few maps, you'll see that'll be the orange hot colours. We would expect the entire South Island would um, feel sort of MM5 and above um, levels of shaking. To put this into perspective for you, every single New Zealander will feel the Alpine Fault rupture. All five million of us will feel it when it ruptures, even those in Auckland. If you happen to be on holiday in Sydney and you're in the, uh, a high story um, building, you will probably notice the building swaying from, from the shaking. People will report feeling this in the east coast of Australia. That's how large um, it will be. This will be certainly the second largest, if not the largest earthquake New Zealand has experienced in recorded um, history. It will have major cascading consequences that I'll, I'll come on to in a minute, and it will have significant um, human environmental infrastructure and economic impacts for not just the West Coast and the South Island, but for New Zealand Inc. as, as a country. So let's look at the shaking intensity. You're going to see a lot, of, a lot of maps now, so let me briefly explain them. This was the original map that we put together way back in 2013. So it's outdated, it's quite old, it's quite basic science, but it's very useful because it allows us to compare to um, the shaking from the Christchurch and the Darfield earthquakes. So what you're seeing here is um, magnitude 8, the black line, is showing the fault rupture the whole length of the Alpine Fault from Milford Sound to somewhere around Lewis Pass. Hot colours are powerful shaking, the sort of that shaking that will cause extreme damage in unreinforced masonry building. Even well-built structures would, would suffer damage in these orange and yellow zones. And then as you move out into these cooler blue colours, um, you're getting powerful shaking, sort of certainly scary shaking, but not necessarily damaging. I'll come on and show you the updated um, models in a minute, but what I want to do is, is give you a sense of this. As you can see, this is the entirety of the South Island getting very strong shaking. To put this in perspective, that is the same colour scheme and the same scale of map, the extent of shaking from the Darfield earthquake uh, in 2010, um, and that is the same scale and, and colours again for the 22nd of February uh, magnitude earthquake. Um, so you, you can see that. The uh, bottom earthquake before the Kaikoura earthquake was the most significant earthquake we'd experienced in New Zealand. Huge damage to one of our major urban centres. Um, and you've got that tiny, tiny little dot there of, of sort of red, uh, sorry, orange and yellow colours. Whereas for an Alpine Fault, this is the entirety of the coast and most of the Alpine region as well. As I say, though, that, that's slightly out of, of date. Um, and one of the reasons that's, that's out of date is we've, we've subsequently realised that the direction that the earthquake uh, ruptures in is very important. And that's because, in this instance, we assume that the epicenter, which is often what we think about earthquakes, would be somewhere around Mount Cook. So energy goes both south and north. However, if this earthquake were actually to occur somewhere near Milford Sound, the epicenter would be quite rural, quite far away from many of our population centres. So you might think that that would be a good scenario. That would actually be our worst case scenario for very good reason, because while the epicenter would be here a long way from, um, from, from major population centers, all of the energy is going to rupture north for about 400 kilometers. And so all of the energy is going to keep on traveling. Um, so Nelson, um, Christchurch, places like that, will experience very strong shaking. Um, I haven't included the North Island in this map, but obviously the shaking doesn't stop just because it reaches um, the coast. It doesn't need to get on the Inter-Islander. It carries on going. Wellington will get a very, very strong shake from this um, as well. So one of the things we're very keen to explore is how does where this epicenter um, occurs affect the shaking? Versus, so how does shaking look if we have an epicenter near Milford Sound versus an epicenter um, in Mount Cook versus an epicenter up here near, near um, 
guana like like brana. So that's what I'm going to show you now is the most up to date modeling um, using some of those colors. So this is the extent of shaking that we've uh, we think is our best available model. If the earthquake were to initiate somewhere near Hokitika um, and Greymouth, um, that's the yellow. Uh, sorry, the, the white uh, dot there. This is where our epicenter is. Um, the red box here is my very, very crude estimation of the, the extent of Timaru District, so you can see the sort of shaking you're getting there. And again, I've shown you the shaking, the strength's not there. We're very concerned about anything that is sort of a yellowy orange up to a deep red. As you can see, the west coast as expected, but even here in Timaru, we have damaging to heavily damaging um, shaking um, occurring in parts of our, our district, particularly up um, in the mountains region. And then if I flick forward and we change the epicenter to the center, if I just flick backwards and forwards there quickly, you can see how the shaking changes. And the reason for this is now, in this scenario, we have all of our energy heading south off towards Antarctica, where, oops, excuse me, whereas in this scenario, only half of our energy heads towards Antarctica, half of our energy heads north towards Wellington. So we get a lot more powerful shaking around Greymouth, but you'll notice again, looking at Timaru, there is distinct changes um, in shaking. And if you think about Timaru uh, as the town, which, excuse my geography, is round about there, you'll notice in the, this scenario, we're in this sort of slightly damaging to damaging. But as we play that forward, we start to move into more heavily damaging scenarios. Once we get to our worst case, our nationally worst case scenario, which is an, an epicenter near Milford Sound, in this instance, all of our energy, oops, excuse me, all of our energy now is coming north. So all of it is going up towards Wellington, the North Island. That doesn't have significant changes here in Timaru. Again, if I flick backwards and forwards, you can see either way, as a district, we end up predominantly in this sort of damaging to heavy damaging um, sort of space for shaking. This is something we cannot know before the earthquake. We will get a surprise on the day when it finally goes, whether it's going north to south or south to north. So a lot of our preparation in FA is planned on this scenario with a south to north rupture so we can consider the absolute worst case scenario for, for New Zealand. What I'm going to do now is this shows you the maximum shaking intensity that we would experience. And to, to give you a sense of what, what that's like, that MM7, that damaging shaking, which we would experience um, here in Timaru, that's not the kind of stuff that you try to jump under the table duck cover hold and it's over and you're done. That, that's the kind of shaking where um, you are very, very scared. These desks seem quite heavy. I noticed they're on wheels. Um, but even if they weren't on wheels, they would be jumping around um, the place. Uh, loose roof tiles start to come off. Chimneys, unreinforced masonry chimneys collapse pretty quickly. Um, what I'm going to show you now is an animation which shows you how this earthquake would propagate up the coast. And it's going to show you how long shaking lasts at particular areas, and it's going to show you um, the relative intensity at different times. So it's played at four times speed. So what that means is one set, uh, well, yeah, one, one minute is 25 seconds um, in the animation. And you're going to see the topography jumping up and down. And the amount it jumps up by is the intensity of the shaking. It's, it's exaggerated for effect. But you'll see the waves pass out through New Zealand, and you'll also see how long these areas are shaking for um, as we go forward. It's a video. I saw them testing it earlier and it did work, so fingers crossed. <laughs> yep. So the earthquake started uh, here, just around Milford Sound, and you can see the waves of shaking starting to propagate out. And you can see the in intensity uh, going. Timaru is nicely uh, mentioned here. So we are now 55 seconds a minute after the earthquake started. Here in Timaru, we're none the wiser. Waves haven't reached us yet. <clears throat> Queenstown's just been hit by the shaking, and now it's moving up through um, the Waitaki Lakes. At about this point, minute 30, minute 40, after the earthquake ruptured, the waves reached Timaru. And now the key thing for you guys is to watch how long Timaru shakes for.
So Timur has now been shaking for a full minute. Christchurch has now been shaking for a full minute. Those waves continue to propagate up to the north. Shaking's just about stopped now here in Timaru. That's nearly two minutes after that shaking um, began. Christchurch, two and a half minutes, still shaking as those waves make their way now up to the top of North Island and continue across the Cook Strait to um, Wellington. So there are two things we really worry about with shaking. One is the intensity, which I've just talked to you about and showed you. The other is duration. The length of shaking is really critically important. Um, I normally ask my students this, but I'll, I'll give you the answer rather than ask you questions on the spot because you're not being assessed. Um, actually, no, I will ask you. <laughs> Does anyone have any, eye, any sense of how long the really fat, strong shaking from the Christchurch earthquake was in 2011? It's about, yeah, it's about, it's about 12 to 13 seconds of really powerful shaking. Um, I'm sure James will tell you that felt like an absolute <laughs> lifetime. Felt longer. Um, in, as a city in Timaru and there, that shaking here would go on for probably two minutes. Two minutes is a long time, um, especially if you're listening to me rabbit on about this sort of stuff. It's a particularly long time. But it, it is a very, very long time. That's a lot of time to get yourself under the desk, realize what's going on, and realize it's not stopping, and get quite scared. The difference we would um, experience here is because that shaking is going to go on for so long, it's not going to be as sharp and as violent as you might expect over on the west coast. It will feel quite long wavelength. Be like being out on very rough seas, like you're in a boat. So the whole thing will be shifting around, um, up and down, side to side, um, for a long period of time. There will be a lot of people very scared um, by, that, by that shaking. That's the earthquake. That's... Um, in many ways, where the story starts. The problem with big earthquakes um, like this, in mountainous um, complex terrain like New Zealand, is that they trigger secondary hazards, very complex secondary hazards. So for instance, if you shake a building, that building can often fall down. But if you shake a mountain, the mountain can also fall down. It performs the same way. So if we have a big earthquake like an Alpine Fault, event, that earthquake could trigger landslides up in our mountains. Our mountains are quite narrow, so if a big landslide comes down and falls into a river, it could block the river, forming what's known as a quake lake. Um, that lake is completely uncontrolled, so when it's filled up, it reaches the top, it overspills over the top of the dam, and it erodes a channel. That allows more water to run through, which erodes more of a channel, which allows more water to come through, and eventually it fails catastrophically and you have what's known as a, as a dam break flood. That's just one example of a possible cascade um, that, could, that could, could occur from this. There are a whole heap of hazards. And the important thing here is that for these big earthquakes in mountains, often it's these secondary hazards that are actually far worse than the shaking. As bad as that shaking may seem, landslides um, in mountains can, can be um, far worse. And we have reasonably good examples um, in the past of, of events where the secondary hazards have been more, more damaging. So Christchurch is an excellent example. Liquefaction hazard was arguably more damaging. Kaikoura, um, $2 billion worth of damage to roads from landslides. Tsunamis, Japan, Indonesia, good examples where the earthquake was not the major um, player. If we look at the cascades, we could get an Alpine Fall earthquake. You can't see the details, you don't need to worry, but each of these arrows points to a different hazard that could trigger. This is the earthquake, aftershock, surface rupture, liquefaction, landslides, etc., etc., etc. This could happen over a period of seconds during the shaking, but it could also extend out to be months, to years, to potentially decades worth of um, hazards. And I'll take you through um, some of those now. Of course, we've also got to think about aftershocks. It's New Zealand, we're in the bottom of the Pacific, we have weather events, they won't stop just because we've had an earthquake, and fire is a big issue that we will need to consider as well. So as I said, quickly run through those. Those are just four exa recent examples where we can think about where the secondary hazards were much more um, devastating than the initial shaking. Uh, Christchurch is our example here. And this is Oha Point um, up on State Highway 1 in, in Kaikoura. So let's look at what we think the secondary hazards from an Alpine Fault event might be. Um, this map is not showing you intensity of shaking. 
it's showing you probability of landslides occurring where hot colors is very high probability and cool colors is, is very low probability. So as you'd expect, we don't really have much threat from landslides in the Canterbury Plains. But if we look across um, our entire Alpine region, it's extraordinarily hot. A very, very high likelihood of landslides throughout that region. To give you a sort of sense of numbers of what that might mean, um, currently Cyclone Gabriel, I'm actually doing a lot of mapping for that. We've mapped 10% of the area affected by Cyclone Gabriel. We've mapped 50,000 landslides. Um, the Wenchuan earthquake in China in 2008 was a similar size to this in similar terrain, caused anywhere between 60,000 and 100,000 landslides. The Nepal earthquake in 2015 was 30,000 landslides. So that's the sort of order we're talking on. Fortunately, our, the Alpine regions are not particularly populated, so that's not a major issue for us. The biggest concern is where our critical infrastructure lies in the South Island. And so if we look and overlay, oh sorry, let me uh, first give you some examples of what those landslides might look like. These are very big, large landslides. These are not small little things falling out of retaining walls. These are entire mountains collapsing. Here's a good example from um, Nepal. Um, and here's a longer, much longer term problem that can arise from these events. So if you drop a landslide into a river, the river wants to take all of that sediment away. And so it carries that sediment out of the mountains. And as soon as it reaches flat land, it deposits all of that sediment. The reason we have the Canterbury Plains is because of sediment eroded from the mountains, carried by the rivers, and dropped on the Canterbury Plains. That's what makes them so flat. That's what makes them so fertile. Because every so often, give or take every 300 years, we wipe the topsoil off in big um, uh, aggradation events, um, and then we produ uh, produce new soil. So you can see here an example of aggradation. Um, this was a big landslide that occurred um, up in Porua Valley on the west coast. This is what the area looked like before the landslide. Um, two years afterwards, most of that material has been carried out and filled up the floodplain. And then three years, four years afterwards, all of this extraordinarily productive farmland has been completely um, flooded and inundated. You may have seen pictures of the Esk Valley. It looks very similar to that. If you go there today, it looks very much the same from an event that occurred in 1999. So this is going to be decades of issues in our floodplains at the uh, exit of our mountains that we're going to have to deal with. Again, some more pictures of, of landslides and particularly this time thinking about what landslides do to our critical infrastructure, which is what I want to briefly talk to you about now. So if we overlay our state highway network um, as our main critical road infrastructure on top of this, um, that's what it looks like. Everywhere that you see hot, red, orangey, yellow colours, we would expect to be completely blocked. And if we look very quickly at that, you can see all east-west connections are completely severed. Entry into and out of the west coast, and even along the west coast, is going to be gone. Initial estimates are for a period of about six months. Since Kaikoura, I think we have to take a realistic option that that's going to be significantly um, longer. Um, some of these passes may not reopen. We can also think about our electricity network and where electricity um, lies. So if we overlay that, fortunately most of that exists um, east of the Alps. We do have this particularly hot spot through Arthur's Pass which provides power um, into uh, the west coast. This is the Waitaki um, region here. And the key one is the line that makes it, snakes its way all the way up to the top of the um, South Island and connects us to the North Island. So we would expect instantaneous loss of electricity, certainly to the South Island, possibly nationally. But the key thing for us here on the East Coast is our network is reasonably robust. We don't have mountains to, capable, uh, to get over. Our power system should, key being should, should be able to function and provide us. West Coast, it's a very different um, situation. And then finally, telecoms. What's the first thing everyone does when there's a very big earthquake? Tweet, Instagram, TikTok, I don't know what the current... Um, current gist of it is, but that overloads our network. If all five million of us start texting at once, the network gets overloaded, it crashes. We're going to lose telecoms probably for a few hours before they gradually um, come back on board. Um, they will be intermittent as we have power issues. And then we will also have to deal with trapped people, particularly people trapped on the West Coast, both locals and tourists. If this happens in the height of the summer season, we can have 4,000 people in Franz Joseph alone, 
2,000 people at Milford Sound, however many people in Queenstown, that are all going to need to be evacuated out of those regions um, elsewhere. So I'm sure I don't want to, well, that's where I'll leave you, a very cheery note <laughs> for, uh, for a Tuesday morning. Um, I realize it's a very whistle-stop tour of, of where we're at. This is years and years of science, but um, I want to give you guys the opportunity to ask us some, some questions, if, if that's okay. Oh, sorry, I was going to ask, do you have any good news? <laughs> Do I have any good news? <laughs> I think the good news is um, we've already started thinking about this. We've already started planning for this. So this is not going to catch us by surprise. There will be surprises on the day, but um, you know, the more we prepare for it, the more we talk about this, I appreciate this is scary, but the more we talk about this, the less of a surprise it is and the more able we're going to be to, to deal with it when it happens. That's, that's the good news. The good news is also we're a long way from the Alpine Fault. The shaking here will be strong. Um, and it'll be long, and it'll be very scary. But we're not going to anticipate widespread devastation in, in Timaru. Um, things like unreinforced masonry buildings, chim brick chimneys will collapse. We probably will see liquefaction in some of our, particularly around Wash Dyke and some of our, our reclaimed areas or drained areas. Um, and we will see damage. But we're not going to see the levels of damage that we would expect um, on the West Coast, say, for, for instance. We'll have our own issues to deal with, but um, we're not going to be the f or Timaru, sorry, is not going to be necessarily the focus of an Alpine fault um, event in that sense. I know that's limited good news, but it's good news nonetheless. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the floor, Councillor Paddington? Uh, Tom, would you be able to go back to the maps? Shaking maps? Yeah, the shaking maps, um, wherever they were. Too many animations. So, see where it's orange there, which is heavily damaged. Is that topography? Why has why that come down that way? Yeah, so that would be river channels um, and basin, um, what we call basin effects. So, the, um, the Canterbury Plains are this, this weird little basin of sediment that's been deposited out of the mountains. So, what happens is the reason that when the waves from that video, when they enter the basin, you see that they, they aren't as high as everywhere else, but they stay for a long time. And that's because the soil is able to move around a lot. So, the shaking isn't able to as efficiently pass through. So that's why it takes a lot of time of shaking. It also means that it sort of, um, so shaking in this case would move north, it would actually hit the port hills and then bounce back. So you'd actually get effects of the waves coming back. So you get constructive interference where they build up on top of each other. You've then also got some of the rivers in there that change the shaking profile. So it's it's a complex interplay of what's going on at the surface and what's going on under underground um, that, that, that explains um, that shaking there. Second and last question, you talked about movement up and down and across, would that obviously affect the west coast yep. much worse than it would out this way? Yeah, so the fault displacements I was talking about would be right on the fault, so in somewhere like Franz Josef, that's where you'd see. Out here we wouldn't see anything like that at all because we are 80 plus kilometres away from the fault. Most of that motion would be in the shaking, um, you would probably uh, it's hard to know exactly how much you would move, but you'd probably see no major permanent displacement of the ground in, in Timaru other than through things like liquefaction. Oh, we cheered me up a wee bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I'll go Councillor Parker and then me and Nigel. Um, one, one's more for interest. When um, you showed the slide, when it uh, Hokitika, it went south, not north. Mm. Why, my question is why? Why would it not travel north? And my second question is about tsunami risk. We had a um, tsunami expert here last year, I think, he, and they thought that alpine age wouldn't af affect any tsunami. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, good, great, great questions. So the reason that we don't think it would rupture um, too far to the north from Hokitika is because that's where the Alpine Fault blends into what's known as the Marlborough Fault System. So at that point, you have the Hope Fault, which travels up the Taramakawa River and reaches Kaikoura, um, and then becomes the, the subduction zone. And then you have a series of, of other faults that progress north. It's a very, very complex tectonic region. So the fault is, um, the fault is hindered. It basically can't rupture further north without moving on to a different fault. That's possible, and we've seen that in other earthquakes. Turkey is a very, the recent earthquake in Turkey affected four or five different faults. So that, that's possible. Kaikoura affected 20 different faults, so we can't rule out 
that if it ruptured there, it would move on to the hope fault and spread. But that's very complex to model and understand. So if it started there and stayed on the alpine fault, the only way it has to go is south. That's the only. So that's the reason we've done that. We we can't rule that out. Um, in terms of tsunami, um, normally what you're looking for when you think about big tsunamis is uh, well, you're looking for two things. You're looking for a very uh, large earthquake offshore, um, and you're looking for lots of vertical um, displacing displacement. And by lots, I mean tens of meters, not a couple of meters. So that plays very well for us. The Alpine Fault is almost entirely onshore, so we're not going to displace the seabed very much. Um, and the vertical motion is, whilst I appreciate one to two meters is a lot, in terms of tsunami generation, is not, is not a massive amount. So we, we are not particularly expecting, um, certainly not large tsunamis, um, and certainly not around here on the east coast. Where that gets trickier to answer is um, in our lakes because if you drop a landslide into a lake, it's like jumping in your bath. If you jump in your bath, all the water jumps out. Um, and lakes behave the same. So if you drop a very large landslide into one of our lakes, say in Waitaki or Wanaka or Queenstown, then you can get lake-based um, tsunamis. Obviously, that's not going to be a major um, hazard here in, in, in Timaru. Um, so we can be reasonably confident that tsunami is not one of the things we want to stress about. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's probably just worth mentioning that it will still have that sort of long, strong feeling. So a lot of our community members will think that there's a potential for tsunami mm -hmm. and they'll probably do the long, strong, get gone. Um, so we need to get, from an emergency management point of view, get messaging out quite quickly afterwards to say there isn't a tsunami threat. So certainly our thinking that we will need to get that messaging for our community. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we don't want them heading for the hills uh, in that run, do we? Um, thanks, Dr. Tom. Really appreciate that. A uh, question we've found through flooding, we're so resilient. The whole South Island's um, re oh, sorry, reliant on Christchurch as far as food warehousing, those sorts of things. As far as those you know, main bridges, you know, north-south route, those sorts of things, um, you know, they're going to need checks before they can be used. But are, are you reasonably confident that some of those will still be in place in this scenario? The, the bridges, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so bridge, bridges are um, quite remarkable things, actually. The most, most of the time, your what we call the bridge deck, so the actual bit that you drive on, performs very well under shaking. They're designed to, even very long bridges like the Rakaia or, or over the Rangitata. What, you, what we more worry about is the, the abutments, basically, where you drive up onto the bridges. They, they become particular um, failure points. They need two things really to fail. They need either exceptionally strong shaking or they need to be able to li liquefy. Fortunately, over on this side of the, the Alps, the shaking's going to be strong, but not probably not strong enough to do significant damage. Um, and most of our rivers are gravel-based, so they're not particularly susceptible to liquefaction. So we would expect that those bridges would remain intact, by and large. They will need inspections, um, of course. Um, the more worrying thing is if you get, particularly for our really long bridges, say Rakaia Bridge, it's the longest one, if one end is shaking at a different rate to the other, you can get tension in the middle. So that will really need, need quite a lot of uh, engineering checks. But given the style of shaking and the length, of, uh, the, the intensity of shaking, we could be reasonably confident those bridges um, should be, if not instant, instantly reliable, very soon after an earthquake, they should be able to be reinstated and, and usable. Thank you. And then um, second question, maybe more for James and Phil, what's the message about, you know, households being prepared uh, in regard to AF8? Because, uh, you know, there again we know with other uh, emergencies, you know, people are good for about three days. And, and so what does that look like as far as individual households and, and, and communities? Uh, million dollar question, <laughs> how do we get them prepared? Um, I think if we can get them for three days, it's a good start. Um, but I think these conversations we're having with our communities is that this is going to be a significant event and long duration. So the more planning, thinking, talking we can do now, um, especially our family dynamics, when people are scattered across the South Island, that, that's another dilemma. Um, but yeah, no, there is no silver bullet in my eyes. It's just the more if someone, if someone spends 10 minutes to think about it, that's 10 minutes more prepared they'll be. We can't expect people to hoard. We can't expect people, you know, there's a 
cost of living crisis. So, you know, some people are struggling for day to day and we try and throw this at them. So it's tempering that message. But it's around how we behave and how we act. That community resilience, the repurposing of things. You know, we've all got barbecues, we've all got camping equipment, so how can we repurpose some of that stuff instead of just thinking it's too hard? I think, um, just to add to that, one of the things, if I was encouraging people to be more ready, it would probably be about water storage. Um, most of the other things, you know, we'll, we'll be able to get our way through, but if we end up with damage to our water systems, that, that would be a, a, you know, a quite a critical thing. So, you know, it doesn't take much to get a few bottles and have them filled up and change them every couple of years. Just on that note, at our climate change meetings, I, uh, somebody suggested you put uh, water in your freezer, and especially if you've got a chest freezer, it makes your freezer more efficient and then it lasts longer and, and you've got it there. Um, what about building owners? Is there any specific advice for building owners? Or, you know, you talked about un, um, unsupported masonry buildings and things like that. Anything they can they can do to be, to be ready other than the normal earthquake strengthening that's required? I think the, the key thing is, you know, the earthquake prone building process that all councils have to go to in identifying those earthquake prone buildings and then working out what's appropriate for your particular district as far as, you know, the use of those buildings and the strengthening of those buildings. So I know, you know, I know in Waitaki, you know, sorry, Waimati, they've identified quite a few and they're going through sort of strengthening programs down there with those building owners. Um, I mean, if you if you were ruthless about it, you'd say we don't have re unreinforced masonry buildings in this country anymore. You just get rid of them, but that's not that's not reality. So you have to work with those building owners to to work out how you make them as safe as we can. Councillor Booth, thank you, um, uh, Tom. Just a um, couple of things. Uh, I believe Niwa have developed a facility in, in Twizel to assist with information around um, AF8. I was just wondering, perhaps explain what its role is. Um, and the other thing is Timaru's uh, built on be, um, basalt rock. Um, is there an advantage being on basalt rock compared to a few other um, towns and districts? Um, I'm, I'm actually unfamiliar with Niwa's um, site up in, in Twizel that's um, around AF8. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. That's that, that's that's new to me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, so I can't I can't speak to that. I'm, I'm afraid. Um, in terms of being built, built on basalt rock, yes, it's very much an uh, well. It's both an advantage and a disadvantage at the same time. So it's an advantage in that your chances of liquefaction are very low. Being built on hard rock is is very good for that. Um, so and we've all you know, witnessed. What the uh, what liquefaction can do in parts of Christchurch um, over there. So that, that so that's the good news from that side. The, uh, the the bad news, I guess, from that side is, is when you're on hard rock like basalt, what it can do is it transmits the shaking much more effectively. So the shaking is perhaps not as long, but it's much stronger. So that that's the trade-off. You can either have long shaking or you can have strong shaking. Um, and when you're on soft sediments, it tends to be longer but not very strong. And when you're on hard rock, it tends to be not very long. But quite quite strong. So what it may be is that in this part of Timaru, for instance, when you're we're on basalt, perhaps that shaking doesn't last two minutes. Um, it, it's uh, you know half that, maybe a minute or so, because the energy passes through quite quickly. But as a result, that energy is going to be quite a bit bit stronger. Whereas if you move, move out into the Wash Dyke region, for instance, where you're on alluvial soft old marshlands that's been drained, the shaking there perhaps won't be as strong but it will certainly last a long time, and that's where you will definitely get lots of liquefaction in those drained um, and reclaimed areas and those areas around old marshlands and, um, and river channels. Councillor Scott. Uh, thanks, Tom. Obviously, you have um, a wealth of knowledge around this, and you know, I'd like to think that you're working closely with government on um, preparing our country as a whole for this devastation. Um, are they ready if it happened tomorrow? My question would be, <laughs> they are not. So like, what, where does this sit with a, as a priority for our country? COVID's gone now. Let's talk about AEF8 or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, excellent, excellent question, um, of which I am 
not considering my response, but making sure I would consider. If it happened tomorrow, I, th I think uh, we've also got Cyclone Gabriel and response going for that, so that side. Where does this sit in terms of government pr priorities? Um, I'm not part of government, so I can't definitively say to what, what where government sits with this. But this is well known within central government as well. It's well, con it's well um, thought out. There's been lots of work done on this. AFA is, is you know, the a AFA is in many ways the culmination of a lot of this work rather than the start of it. it it's, it's coming to that point. So this is well seated within government. There's a lot of people very well aware in NEMA, for instance, National Emergency Management um, Authority, very well aware of this and lots of planning for it. I, I think we also need to put this slightly in, pers in perspective um, in that this, everything I presented to you is very scary and I don't want to now downplay everything I've said, but we also have to think about there are other big scenarios for New Zealand which would be worse for New Zealand Inc. A big rupture of the Wellington Fault, for instance. You know, that would be a smaller earthquake than this, but it would hit Wellington, you know, the sea of power, huge amounts of population, lots of damage. We have the Hikarangi. We have uh, reason, reason to believe that could go very, very large, much larger than Alpine Fault, and then we have tsunami um, concerns on um, in the North Island and parts of the South Island as well. We have cyclones. We have Mount Taranaki, um, Taupo um, volcano as well. So the Alpine Fault is a scary prospect for us in the South Island, and is a scary prospect for us in New Zealand. I would say it's probably not our absolute as as New Zealand Inc. It's not our massive, most massive um, concern, not to downplay it. That's not to say we don't need to worry about this. We do. But I think government are very well aware of this because of the success of AF8. But I think the success of AF8 has also shown a light on the fact that there are worse things out there for us as a country that we also need to be prepared for. So there's there's lots of work going into this, um, thinking about Hikarangi Margin, thinking about Wellington, um, and thinking about um, all the other things going on. If this happened tomorrow, would we be pre prepared for it? We'd be more prepared than we were yesterday, um, but not as prepared as today, which is a ridiculous cliche to, to answer to you. But we we have to just keep working towards that. We are never going to be prepared for it. You know, there, there's never going to be a point where you can slap your hand down and go, job done, we're prepared for an alpine fall. It, it, when it happens, it will catch us by surprise and there will be bits and pieces that happen. And so we just need to iteratively keep making ourselves more prepared, keep having conversations like this, um, keep coming down and presenting this, talking to local um, populations and making people, sure people iteratively get there because, as I say, you know, tomorrow we'll be better prepared than we are today um, and keep moving that way. And I think that's the approach we have to, to take to this because it's too scary to do all at one go. Not just to add, add to that question about the government, um, what they're doing is doing a piece of work on creating a um, catastrophic plan handbook um, which takes into account these these hazards that Tom's just talked about, and you know they are well understood. Um, just as an example, within that handbook, it will it will challenge the way, or it's challenging government to think about the problems that get created. So, for example, we know if there's lots of, um, or when someone you know someone passes away, there's a a really strong coroner's process to to make sure that the cause of death can be determined. Um, but if you've got lots of people who have passed away, how do you do that? Um, so this handbook will take that into account and take us through a pro process um, in how to manage that and how to manage our electricity generation system, our roads, our telecommunications, um, our fast-moving consumer goods, our groceries, how we'll distribute those. They're all being thought of and they'll all have a part in this handbook. Not for any one specific hazard, but for these big catastrophic, what they're calling catastrophic events for New Zealand. Um, so that's a, that's a good step forward. And um, while it's a bit scary, um, actually looking forward to seeing those because that will then help drive how I plan and how Phil plans uh, here in Canterbury and in Timaru. I actually have a similar question for Phil. Um, at point seven in the report, you talk about the uh, response plan that you're working on with Mid-South Canterbury. So how far through that work are we and, and how ready are we if something happens tomorrow or next week? I don't, yeah, just to repeat the same things, I don't think we'll ever be ready, but we, we've had six workshops. Uh, the attendees have all taken something away to work on within their own agency and we've got a better understanding of how we would all help each other and work together. So, uh, yes, 
without, you know, we've got not a lot on paper, but we've got a lot of um, assumptions tested and disproven, a lot of urban myths, one's going proven, disproven. Um, next week we're meeting with aviation providers and airfield operators to once again understand the role they will be able to play, but we need to understand what they need from us um, to enable them to operate. So, yeah, I'm maybe by the end of this year, I'm hopeful that we'll have a pretty good framework of how we would react. But I think the key thing is we've identified is the communications and access. So if we can't all meet in a room, how are we going to know who's doing what where so we're not doubling up but we're not also leaving communities isolated so if we know a particular agency is in that community and they're going to do that we may go look elsewhere because we know that they've given us that undertaking that they'll do that task and while you're developing that plan i take it you're looking to the hawks bay and gisborne and, and what was learnt from those disasters and 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 adjusting and adapting as you go along Yep, definitely, and I think that's one of the first things we identified when we started talking about the AFA plan, response plan for Mid-South Canterbury, was that a prescriptive plan that goes from A to Z won't, will not work. Uh, it's a very much a concept of operations, very loose framework at the very start of what we will, each agency is responsible for and, and mandated to deliver, and then a whole series of sub-plans that will deal into a particular issue, so fuel, electricity, um, aviation assets. So the theory is, if it's not the AFA, it's Hikarangi, a tsunami, or if it's a um, significant cyclone, we have got this, these plans up our sleeve. And because, and the reason why we did the Mid-South Canterbury concept is because we're all so interdependent on each other. Um, response agencies are responsible for that area, so we couldn't plan in isolation. That's great. Any other questions? No, well, thank you, gentlemen. That was uh, a fantastic presentation, and you know, along with scaring the bejesus out of us, I'm sure, I'm sure we've all been fully informed about the risks. Um, so I'll just move to the recommendation that the environmental, the Environment Services Committee, receives and notes the project called the AFA Alpine Fault Magnitude Eight Data. If someone would like to move that, thank you, Councillor Jackson, and seconded Councillor Booth. All in favour. Please say aye. aye. Aye against. Carried. Thank you very much. So I think uh, the last um, item on the agenda is just going back to the matter of minor nature that was uh, raised by Councillor Booth. So I'm just going to ask Mr Cooper, and apologies for putting you on the spot before the meeting, but... If you could just um, outline for us the district plan process versus um, the process for a private plan change, and then what are the barriers uh, and what levers, if any, that council have to speed that process up to ensure that we're enabling. I'll just put them there just in case you need a reminder. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Councillor Booth. Great question. Uh, and uh, it's a huge question. Um, so what, what we've done already uh, when we've been preparing for the district plan review is we, um, we did our growth management strategy to inform that review process. We, then, we did that in 2018 and that was signed off and then we went and re-looked at that and um, about 18 months ago we started that process and we re-looked at the growth management strategy post-COVID to make sure it was still uh, fit for purpose to inform the district plan review process. What we allowed for in that was, um, based on feedback from council, we wanted to take the, the, instead of taking a conservative approach and planning either on the median or low projections for growth, we took uh, the high, and then we went uh, to, for example, our zoning for uh, industrial growth and for housing development. What would that look like on the high, based on the high uh, population growth predictions and predictions for economic growth for the next 25 years or so. So we were looking through a 25 year lens through that process for the district plan which covers technically I suppose it's around for 10 years at a time. But so how we did that was we developed those future development areas to signal to the market and to Timaru district 
that um, we intend to grow into these areas and zone these areas at particular trigger points. Um, some of the FDAs, as we call them, were, uh, had a five-year horizon, some were sooner than that, and some were beyond 10 years. Um, so to answer your question, that, that's how we started the process to try and provide uh, a foundation of evidence uh, for the district plan review process, but also a future-proof growth um, in terms of what might be needed if we were able to accelerate growth in the Timaru district, what would that look like? So that, that work was done um, through that refresh process. Now that the district plan, uh, the proposed district plan uh, has been notified, uh, that is following its statutory process where we've been out for submissions. For the first round of consultation, we've had 300 submissions come back in. Um, we then, we're very sure we've been entering those into the system, which is turned out to be quite a uh, complicated business, but we're almost finished. Uh, and, and then shortly we'll be providing a summary document on all those 300 submissions before we then go back and ask for submissions on submissions, which is in Schedule 1 of the RMA. That's the prescriptive process that we go through for a district plan review process. Once we've gone through that, uh, we get into the hearing stage. We've identified 24, 25 topics to be heard uh, by a lead commissioner. Um, supported by other commissioners and elected members on a panel. And that those panels will hear uh, evidence for and against um, the proposed plan changes or the changes that we've got in the plan that will uh, enable for that, that future growth. The spanner in the mix has been the national policy statement area for highly productive land, uh, which is a reasonably blunt instrument and if it's applied as it's written currently, uh, quite restrictive for our future plans beyond 10 years because we're surrounded by highly productive land, either class one, two or three, uh, which means that's uh, expanding our urban footprint either for in, uh, industrial and economic growth or for uh, residential growth is going to be problematic uh, under that NPS. So we've started talking to the ministry about how we might work with that uh, and the feedback from the Ministry so far has been that we're in a unique position of just notifying, being at this point in the process, having our particular geographic and uh, topography challenges that we have in terms of where we can expand our, our uh, urban footprint. Um, and uh, they're very interested in our case. So hopefully that translates to some help uh, in navigating the MPS. So, so that's the context where we arrive uh, to the point where we are now in terms of how can council um, encourage growth beyond that. So we, we've, we've done that part of the district plan process and we've fed into that and we've done as much as we can go there. Um, if, for example, we were to receive an application for a development, uh, so let's say a housing development, that was outside current zoning and required a plan change, um, it is possible to tackle that in a couple of different ways. Um, if it was to be tackled by way of a plan change to the current operative plan, that process is pretty similar to the district plan review process itself. It's the same process. It's a statutory process where you, you have the submissions, um, you have hearings, uh, you work your way through your process and then sort of three, two to five years, depending on how, uh, how much opposition there is to the change, you'll find yourself at the other end of that and you might have the plan change in effect. Uh, a variation to the proposed district plan, that's another option that is available to um, uh, developers or uh, people out there who might want to uh, approach things outside of the current uh, arrangements in terms of zoning. Uh, that places council in a far more um, influential point in that process, I suppose, because it would be, uh, to give effect to that variation, it would have to come to council, to be a proposal that would come to council, uh, and you'd all sit around, uh, discuss and debate the merits uh, or otherwise of the particular proposal, uh, and if you recommended the variation, then that would follow uh, that variation process to the proposed district plan and go through the 
and sort of uh, run alongside and then join eventually join in with the district plan review process. So that, that might be slightly quicker uh, and it may uh, be that council can have more of a say in that process. At the other end of both processes, ultimately there'll be a commissioner that will sit down with his panel or her panel uh, and make that decision. Um, it'll be objective based on evidence against the <coughs> criteria in the RMA uh, and the, um, the district plan review process, whether that be the, the proposed district plan that you're trying to uh, change. If it meets favour with that panel, it can go through. If it doesn't, it may require some modification or it may be rejected. Uh, that influence on that panel is is not something that can happen. There's a, a separation between council officers, uh, elected members, and that decision-making body. Uh, so that process um, remains um, sacred, if you like. So, so there, they are uh, broadly speaking uh, the two options that would be available for uh, a development that would be proposed to be on land that currently is zoned rural, for example, or has some other uh, zoning to it at the moment. And then, and then of course, we have the, uh, we'd have to prove that it wasn't highly productive land somehow, or offset that, uh, the value of that highly productive land by some other means uh, through that process. So it's, it's not an easy answer. Um, and if you were to ask me what uh, levers council might be able to have within that process, I would say uh, the best influence that you could have would be through a variation to the proposed district plan. Of which we would be able to have a paper presented to us and we could have a vote in saying this is what we want to do? Yes. Okay. Now, if I may just go back and give a little bit of background, um, as in why I've what I raised this. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm on the Bench at Timaru. I'm, I mean, I was, I, I've been on the board for something like five years now, six years now. Anyway, um, and it's always been our biggest identifiable problem to the growth of our town of the lack of of uh, suitable land for um, um, housing um, in in our district. And unfortunately, while the people are using the, uh, the growth numbers as the reason why not. Those, the, it's, that's precisely the reason uh, why we need it. I mean, if we're going to change from being a retirement home um, and to something else that is going to be a lot more equitable for our district, uh, we need to change those, those settings. And, the, and the, 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 I've read the economic um, reports around uh, we've still got land within our district which is, has not been taken up and, and alongside the, um, the uh, suggestion that we start in building which, which we are um, now but uh, we need, uh, you know, it's been identified and the other districts around us have shown it that we desperately need to take action uh, around uh, opening up land for um, for housing and uh, yeah. creating greenfield areas, um, and, and we are missing a major ch uh, a rung in our ladder for people getting on the property ladder, people coming to live in Timaru, rent a house, um, and therefore bring their family and enjoy all the benefits that we have to offer, such as jobs and livestock. Um, and while we keep looking at these reports to say we're not going to getting growth, we're precisely the problem why we're not getting growth, because we're, we're simply encouraging the continuance of being a rest home um, and not actually um, encouraging families to come here, and, and it's a major issue. And we, we've just had our strategy meeting for um, our, our economic development, and, and it, was, it was front and centre again, and yet we keep getting told we can't do things. Well, We've got to change that, and I'm not sure. I guess the reason for bringing this up is that we need to make sure while we we can see what the issues are, we need to make sure that the whole council is in behind uh, what what we need to do uh, to change that, that environment. 
Thanks, Councillor Booth. Uh, I would say there are other options to influence outcomes. Um, jobs, if, if economic conditions changed dramatically and, and that pressure uh, was placed on the housing market, money talks, as they say, and then plan, chains fo uh, plan changes follow. Uh, so, so if a developer sees an opportunity um, and the demand is quite clearly there, that pressure, that uh, pressure from economic growth is, a, uh, uh, is pushed and transferred onto the housing market and prices go up markedly, for example, driven by that pressure, you would then have the evidence to then have that uh, plan change, but more importantly, you'd have the market conditions that would bring the de developers in. And the absence of that... Um, the, another meaningful way that council could be involved is if, if it were to be the developer or partner with the developer and, um, and make that happen itself, uh, as in buy the land and develop it and put it on the market. Um, and then through that process, um, go through a plan change or a variation uh, and, and invest in that in order to get a particular outcome. That, that they're the two main ways that I see council having a meaningful impact if it were to choose to do that. So how do we so we how do we start that motion uh, going forward? How do we get that underway? Do we actually have a paper presented to us? I mean, obviously you're not going to get the the, the numbers uh, as I said before are going to show that we uh, we haven't got growth. But in actual fact, we know that we actually have and we would have and um, it, it's a bit like every other district they've obviously ignored what information they've had and we've been told by our central government and made given all sorts of reasons why we can't do stuff but in actual fact we're just we're just um, cutting out cutting off our nose to spite our face and while everyone else is just having a, a great old time so um, yeah okay Anything further? I'd um, be happy to um, bring a paper uh, to discuss options and the pros and cons of each of those, but um, uh, they may well be uh, something Council might want to consider as an issue for the long-term plan. That might be the process by which we can do that. I guess I just don't want to wait another 10 years. I'd like to think that we can get some action underway and have something actually happening within a couple of years. That's where we need to be. Cool, thank you, Councillor Booth. We'll just go to Councillor Scott. You got something? Just, just to add to that, I, th I think there's another scenario too, and that's actually um, talking to our large developers within our community around the land that they own and what is their, what is their vision for this land, we have a, we have several large landowners in our in our district, and it would be great to be able to incorporate their visions into these these kind of conversations because uh, to enable them to be successful too. We'll go back to Councillor Booth one more time, and then Councillor Paddington, and then we better wrap up because I always seem to hog the meeting time. Uh, and, and yeah, Nigel. Uh, yeah, look, just um, to that, Councillor Scott, um, we don't really want to leave it up to our property developers. We need to actually identify the land and where we want our town to be and to go and, and enable that land to be there. And they'll, they'll all scrap amongst each other to actually get that happening because it'll be worth a lot of money to them. Councillor Puddington. I guess following on from my fellow councillors, we want to be seen as a council that's proactive and enabling. So I'd like to see what Alan said, something brought to us to show our community that's what we're there. And I always find some of the arguments a bit simplistic, Paul. Um, you know, I had someone come to Timaru, got offered a job at a dairy factory, but opted to go to Sinlay and Rolleston because there was a new house in that price range. We've got lots of old houses, good houses, but we're not encouraging young people with cheap land to get within the government, you know, perimeters, if you like, um, the parameters to buy and get into those things and opening up new land 
that we've identified in 10 years, maybe that should be in three years to help encourage those things and not necessarily rely on some consultant from Napier or wherever to tell us how to run our town. So I'd back Councillor Booth to the hilt on that. Thank you. I'll try and be quick for you. Um, yeah, look, in come election time, there's a variety of policies which may affect some changes in this space as well. I see the Nats have pulled out that we're um, going to need at least 30 years, which will line up with um, probably what we've got under district plan um, without the NPS uh, for highly productive land changes. One of my questions was more actually back to Venture Timaru, and we had a good discussion last time around um, you know the need to support some of these conversations with data because we keep throwing because I, I fully support this conversation in a part uh, in a you know paper coming back to council um, and you've just said that you've had a strategy meeting did you discuss some of those points around getting and driving that data I noticed there's a survey out at the moment maybe that was an opportunity to include that has that been done It's part of their adopted plan, which is uh, um, 75 by 2050, which is our population, uh, what we would like to achieve. So you can't do that unless you ha have new housing and new opportunities and new land. So that's, that is part of the whole deal. You know, no, so that doesn't answer my question. So what, what we said last time was, because everyone likes to come to this chamber and say, well, I talked to this person, I talked to that person, it's anecdotal, but we talked about data uh, fact-driven, and I think maybe Councillor Scott, you might be able to talk better to that, but is that something that got discussed at that meeting to, to um, better support the conversation? No, definitely. We had presenters from Health, Ministry of Education, some of those enabling factors that if we were to go to 75,000, what impact does that have on our health services? What does it have, what impact would that have on our schools? So trying to build that data, and definitely like the Ministry of Education in particular had some great statistics on what, what impact that would have on our community. So definitely starting to bring all of that data in so we can present at the council of what would actually need to happen in order to have those numbers here. Sorry, but also the data to support the demand that's there now. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess that's just the the chicken and egg thing that I probably mentioned. If the settings aren't right, the growth numbers are not actually going to be reflected. So we know we've got a lot of activity, uh, economic activity in our GDP. Everything's going up, but the the um, the the numbers, and again, the economic reports that we've had don't reflect that. But we do know that that is what's happening, and that's all I, that's all I can say. Yeah, one more time. I think the question that I'm asking of the Economic Development Agency is, you've got a whole lot of businesses out there, you've got a whole lot of jobs on Trade Me. Do a survey, understand exactly how many jobs we would have, how many people would be coming to this area um, and that would be really an easy piece of work and that would support the conversation. But currently that work hasn't been done. That would be a really, really easy piece of work. And I challenge you guys to take that back to the Economic Development Agency and make, sure, make that an action. Cool, thank you. And one last comment I would have is asking councillors how familiar we all are with the proposed district plan and what areas have been identified for development in the plan that's already in place and should be finalised within the next one or two years, and then what areas further to that do we think we need? But anyway, thank you all for the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Um, I will close the meeting at 11, what is that, 29? Thank you.